You know, I'm glad that, that I can look you in the eye and, and say with complete honesty that I love this handy dandy little book. You know, it's one that we call the Bible. Um, and I read from it. It's, it's a treasured part of, of my workday routine. Every day I go into my office and I, and I sit down and I read out of this book. I read, I kind of follow a lectionary sort of approach to it. I read every morning, I read three chapters from the Old Testament because it's just that much bigger than everything else. I'll read a psalm, I'll read a, a gospel chapter, and then, you know, from the New Testament epistles. Um, every morning. So I've been through it more than once. Some parts, many, many times. And there are verses in this book that just thrill my soul. And there are verses in this book that still confuse me. And there are verses in this book that upset me. Sometimes even make me angry. And like many of you, I, I, I have verses that I, I like more than others. And I would tell you that, that I have verses that are my favorites, plural, but my wife reminds me that it really doesn't work that way. You can have lots of things you like, but you can only have one favorite. Okay? By definition, favorite is that thing that's better, that you like better than all the others. Um, so, I'm not sure which verse is my favorite. Uh, because that tends to change, you know, depending on the circumstances that are going on and so forth. Sometimes one verse will speak to me more than others do. Um, just, that's how it works. But what I can tell you, with, with complete honesty, and heartfelt enthusiasm and accuracy that I do have a favorite word in this Bible. And if Mary Jo were still here with us, sitting down in her spot in the pew, she'd grin at right now. She would shoot me her Mary Jo grin uh, because we've talked about that, Mary Jo and I, several times. And, uh, and she liked that word too. I don't know if it was her favorite word, but it's my favorite word. It is. It's just a tiny little word. It's only three letters long. It's got one vowel, two consonants. And yet, in spite of its size, it's, it's one of the biggest little words in our Bible. And before you go, you know, leaping to conclusions, I'll let you know that the three-letter word that I'm speaking of is not God. Even though I do dearly love God. But to me, God is, is so much more than a, a mere word. He's a supreme being. He's, he's unsurpassed in his, his loving and gracious ways. And he's far, far more important to me, far more closer to my heart than any word could ever be. So God's not my favorite word. But we've heard it today. We heard it in our letter to the Romans no less than four times. I get right in our fingers up here. And I'll read that part of the passage that contains my favorite word again. Paul writes, The scripture says, All who have faith in him won't be put to shame. There is no distinction between Jew and Greek because the same Lord is Lord of all, who gives richly to all who call on him. All who call on the Lord's name will be saved. So now you get it. You caught my emphasis on, on my favorite word each time I, I, I read it, right? Because my favorite word in this Bible is simply and profoundly all. Oh. Oh. And I love it as it occurs in this passage that, that we've just read today. It really speaks to me, but it speaks even louder, that little three-letter word, uh, would loom even larger in our, in our understanding if we would pause to consider another place where it also occurs in Paul's letter to the Romans. If you had your Bible, you could flip back a few pages from that 10th chapter, go back to the 3rd chapter, let your eyes wander down to that 23rd verse, and there you encounter my favorite little word again. Because Paul says, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. You have my favorite words in there, but it's not so comfortable in this verse because we're reminded in Romans uh, chapter 3, verse 23, of a human affliction, a human condition that is common to all of us, every single person. Because notice what Paul says. Paul doesn't say that just a few or the ne'er-do-wells or, or the people who don't come to church as often or as reverently as we like to think that we do have fallen short. 
No. He's emphatic. We've all sinned. All of us. Every single one of us. From the least of us to the greatest of us, regardless of our race or financial status or social standing or fame or any of that other stuff. All of us have been broken by the inescapable reality of our human sin. And that sin comes between us and our righteous God. And if nothing was to be, were to be done about that, we would remain separated from him to our detriment, to our ultimate peril. No one's exempt from this. All have sinned. So we all have a problem. And it's a huge problem that we can't fix on our own. So we all need help if we want to live. If we want to live better lives here and now, lives with a hope for a future that's the kind of future that we want, we all need that help. So my favorite little word in the Bible, only three letters long, shows the scope of the problem that we all have. But that's not all that it shows. Not even close. Go back to those verses from Paul's letter to the Romans that we read earlier this morning. Look at them one more time. Uh, because they really are important. Because the apostle, speaking truthfully and emphatically to the people of God, that includes you and me, says the scripture says all who have faith in him won't be put to shame. There's no distinction between Jew and Greek because the same Lord is Lord of all who gives richly to all who call on him. All who call on the Lord's name will be saved. In these few verses that contain my, my favorite little word in, in all of the Bible, we are told to whom forgiveness of sins will be given. And it's an important distinction. We need to hold on to this. Because forgiveness of sins is not just granted to the well-to-do or to those who haven't made major blunders in their lives like some of us have, or those who are really good at being churchgoers, or who excel at their jobs, or who function very well in society. No, it's much better than that. Which is really good news, like I said, to those of us who have made some horrendous blunders in our lives. Who haven't made good choices all the time. Who have strayed from the path that we should have taken. Forgiveness of sins, which allows the removal of our shame and our guilt over all of the stuff that we've done wrong is given to all, all who have faith in God. It's that three-letter word. It's quite possibly the biggest little word in our Bible. It's quite possibly the biggest little word in our lives. We need to realize that. Because we live in a time when our society make sharp <clears throat> distinctions. We're very polarized. You know, we have sharp distinctions between the rich and the poor, um, between those who are living in comfort within the mainstream of society and those who struggle to survive on the margins of society. We have haves and have-nots, the ins and the outs, and yet we are told again today that all of us, regardless of our, of our standing in society, all of us have the one and same God. There is no distinction. We all have the same God, which is a really good thing because the God that we have isn't some stingy God who, who parcels out little tidbits of, of favor to just a very select few. Those who manage to keep their noses clean, who avoid making the mistakes that so many of the rest of us make, Using that biggest little word in our Bible, Paul reminds us again today that our God gives richly to all who call on him. God gives with, with an amazing, immeasurable abundance to all who seek him. And again, we're being told that nobody stands outside of the reach of God's grace. Nobody. All who call on him. Every single person who comes to God, seeking God, receives God. And that's a good thing. 
Because that, that biggest little word in our Bible tells us the full extent of, of what God is going to do for us when we're told that all who call on the Lord's name will be saved. And by saved, Paul means being saved to eternal life, saved to a perfect and unending future at God's side. There's no greater gift than that. And it's given to all who come to God. All, everybody. What you have done in your past has no bearing on your salvation to eternal life. No mistake is so big or so awful as to be able to counteract God's amazing, redeeming grace. No matter what you may have done in the past, God is ready, God is willing, and God is able to save all who come to him. All. Church only has three letters. But it's the biggest little word in our Bible. It's the biggest little word in our lives. That biggest little word tells us that all of us need to be saved. It tells us that all of us can be saved. It tells us that all of us will be saved when we come to Christ. Praise be to God. For the richness of his grace revealed to us in that biggest little word. Amen.